Plato's Republic, Key Concepts As is well known, Plato wrote three dialogues on ideal states, namely, the Republic, the Statesman, and the Laws. Scholars believe that of the three, it is the Republic that can be considered as Plato's greatest work, though its influence on the world of politics has not been entirely wholesome. In fact, the Republic has helped to form the intellectual background for many non-democratic governments, both communist and fascist. In what follows, I will briefly sketch the key concepts of Plato's Republic. The Problem To understand Plato's notions of government, it is important to consider the actual types of government that a Greek, such as Plato, encountered in his contemporary world. Plato lists them in the eighth book of the Republic, namely, Timarchy, Oligarchy, Democracy, and Tyranny. Timarchy was a state where the ruling principle was love of honor. Plato used the example of Sparta, which had a constitution unique to mainland Greece. Plato admired the Spartan constitution, though he recognized some of its faults. The Spartan elite, the so-called Spartiates, were a military aristocracy who lived off a peasant population. Known as helots, these serfs worked the land for their Spartiate masters, giving them half their produce. The helots were kept in subjection by brutal methods. In fact, Sparta had a secret police to root out any disaffection, and each year the Spartan magistrates formally declared war on the helots so that killing one of them was not murder, but an act of war. The Spartiates themselves were a military caste that trained from early youth to excel in warfare. The Spartans were courageous and disciplined, and Plato admired them for it. Yet he also considered them to be slow-witted, greedy, and brutal to the underclasses. The word oligarchy comes from the Greek's words oligoi, which means few, and arche, which means rule. Hence, oligarchy literally means rule by a minority. In archaic Greece, the minority had been aristocrats, that is, men of good family, but in Plato's time, the minority that controlled oligarchic governments was the wealthy. It is interesting to note that Plato distrusted the profit motive and the influence of private wealth in politics. Plato used Athens as an example of a democratic government. Athens in Plato's day may have had as many as 300,000 residents, including men, women, slaves, and resident aliens who had little hope of acquiring citizenship, but the right to vote was restricted to male citizens. Sovereign power was vested in an assembly which was required to meet at least 10 times a year, though meetings were often more frequent. At these assemblies any male citizen who attended could vote, but only a small minority did since attendance was difficult for citizens living in country villages. It is important to note that Plato had little respect for the system. As is well known, the salient feature of democracy was liberty where individuals could do or say what they pleased, which gave society an attractive variety, but ultimately this freedom worked against social cohesion. When social cohesion failed, society disintegrated into class warfare between the rich and the poor. Finally, there was tyranny, which was the personal rule of a dictator. A tyrant needed a private army for self-protection and had to eliminate all possible rivals. A tyrant, Plato argued, was essentially a criminal. Now, it must be noted that for Plato, each form of government just mentioned has a problem, and as we can see, Plato attempted to address it. This is exactly the reason why Plato wrote The Republic. The Republic, therefore, is the solution to the problems inherent in all four forms of government just mentioned. Let me now briefly sketch the key concepts of the Republic. The Solution of the Republic Having found fatal flaws in each of the existing governmental systems, 
Plato proposed his ideal constitution. According to Plato's system of government, the lawgiver whose task it was to establish this utopia set up three groups or classes. The first class, composed of guardians, was in charge of ruling and would have to be carefully educated and pass exacting tests before being accepted as guardians. Once this class was selected by the lawgiver, it perpetuated itself by heredity, though occasionally an unsatisfactory son of a guardian would have to be degraded. The next class was the auxiliaries, who carried out the duties of the military, police, and executive officers under orders from the guardians. The third class was composed of the craftsmen, traders, and the like. Plato believed that men fitted to be shoemakers or carpenters should stick to their own trades and leave the ruling positions to those who had been specially trained for the task. To ensure that the guardians carried out the lawgiver's intentions, they had to be carefully fitted for their duties by education in cultural pursuits and physical training. Plato recommended that the poems of Homer and Hesiod be banned due to the fact that their portrayal of the gods was often not edifying. He also believed that their writings made their readers fear death, which could undermine the guardian's ability to die a fearless death in battle. Plato believed strongly in the power of the written word to influence behavior, and so suggested that the young should not read stories where the wicked are happy, or good men unhappy. In fact, Plato felt the poets to be too subversive, and recommended that they be banished. The other arts were not free of Plato's censorship either, however, as he outlawed any music that was too sorrowful or too joyous. Other recommendations for an ideal state included a balanced economic state, in which the guardians would be neither rich nor poor. They would live in simple houses on simple food, as if in an army camp, and they would hold their property in common. It is interesting to note that for Plato, girls and boys should have the same education, and advocated complete equality of the sexes. Plato's advocacy of a strong state is most apparent in his structure of marriage and the family. He believed that marriages should be arranged for the good of the state by lot, although the rulers would actually manipulate the lots in such a way as to ensure that the best sires beget the most children. The state would then remove the children from their parents at birth and, if healthy, they would be reared by the state so that no one could know the identities of his or her biological parents. Plato believed that this system would foster a community in which children regarded all their elders as their fathers and mothers. To make it all work, Plato was not averse to the state propagating certain faucets, noble lies, as Plato called them, of which the most important was that God created three species of men, namely, the men of gold, fitted to be guardians, the men of silver, fit to be soldiers, and the common man of bronze and iron, fit for manual toil. As we can see, the bulwark of Plato's utopia was a lethal mixture of religious propaganda and political science, but in Plato's view, the result would be justice, for everyone would have his proper slot in the political structure, and be satisfied with it. Plato's Last Words on the Ideal State In the Republic, Plato returned twice to the question of ideal government. In The Statesman, he repeated the view that government is a job for experts. He believed that the best government is ruled by an expert, like the ideal lawgiver who laid out the constitution in his republic, but if no such expert could be found, then a law-abiding monarchy was the best alternative. In his last work, The Laws, Plato once again considered the question of what sort of government would rule a city best. It is a remarkably detailed work, which shows that Plato's thought had evolved a good deal since he produced the Republic. For one thing, he placed much higher value now on the rule of law. He believed that complete obedience to the laws solves the problems of political strife. 
Another change is evident in that philosophy had been a vitally necessary ingredient in the Republic, but in the laws philosophy yields pride of place to religion. Plato went so far as to suggest that atheists in the ideal state of the laws should be converted or killed. This seems to represent a remarkable change of heart in Plato's old age. 